Hi, I'm Wendy Orr and welcome to World Read Aloud Day. Now, many of you might know me as the author of Nim's Island, but today I'm going to tell you a bit of a totally different story and read to you from the book. So, because stories are where books began. So long, long ago in Greece, King Minos ruled the island of Crete. Crete was a rich land with an army and a strong navy, stronger than all the other kingdoms around, and you could say Minos was a bully. But he had a problem, as bullies often do. His son was a monster with the head of a bull and the body of a man, and he was called the Minotaur. And every nine years, or maybe every one year, because this story has been around for thousands of years and everyone tells it a little differently. So, every once in a while, the Minotaur had to eat people. And so his father, King Minos, decided that the town of Athens had to send him seven youths and seven maidens, so basically seven teenagers, to be eaten by this horrible monster. But Theseus was the king of Athens' son and he didn't think it was fair, so he volunteered to be one of the youths, but he didn't intend to be eaten. And because this is, is a story, of course, he was very handsome and a real charmer. So King Minos' daughter Ariadne fell in love with him and helped him defeat the Minotaur. And he led all his friends out of the maze that they were trapped in. And the Minotaur never killed anybody again. Now we all know that half bull, half male monsters don't exist, but bulls are so strong and dangerous that they're often a symbol of a powerful king or a god when people believed in lots of different nature gods. Now that makes me think that this is more than an adventure story about a brave hero defeating a monster, even though it might have lasted a long time because we all need to defeat monsters sometimes. So that's why we like reading about it in stories. But about a hundred years ago, archeologists excavated a palace in Crete and they found pictures of two girls and a boy doing backflips over a bull. Now what if this was the seed that started that myth? And no one knows for sure, but I believe that maybe they really did capture teenagers, people who were fit and strong, from all sorts of different places, not just from Athens, but from wherever their navy went. And maybe these acrobats were trained to go over the bulls. And maybe some of them survived and probably most of them didn't. But what if they survived? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to work for? And so somehow, and I don't really know how because that's the magic of writing, this story for me built itself into something completely different. And it became the story Dragonfly Song. And this is the um, Australian book, which has quite a lot of nice stickers on it. And this is the Canadian and American book. So I'm going to read to you from chapter one. I'm skipping the first little bit simply because I have read it out loud so often, I decided I was going to skip into the story for you. Night is warmth of mama, snores of dada, goat rug softness, hearth smoke smell, glowing coals. Now night is screaming, Zufi bursting through door, gasping raiders, Asa waking and the nightmare staying. Brave Zufi out watching the goats, guarding against wolves and lions with his slingshot and rocks, all by himself the very first time. When Asa is big, she can do that too, brave like Zufi. But now Zufi has left goats to run, has forgotten wolves waiting to eat young kids. 
I heard a noise up from the sea, and the moon showed me a band of men climbing the cliffs. Hide, cries Mama, fear eyes staring at her home, her family, her Asa. Fight, says Dada, they'll not take what's ours. Fight, says Gaggy, I'm too old to run. Papa grabs his wood-cutting axe with a heavy stone head, and Tatty picks up her knife, the sharp, shining blade that Asa mustn't touch. But Mama wraps Asa tight in her rug and runs, panting up the hill, far from the house, to tuck Asa in a hollow, under the sharp-scented grey-green bush where Spot Goat's kid was born yesterday. Don't make a sound, says Mama, brushing her fingers over Asa's lips. No matter what you see, no matter what you hear, you stay quiet, still as stone, till I come back. Mama makes her sign that keeps Asa safe and runs back down to home. Asa sees her because the moon is shining bright and round, and Asa's eyes are open, a tiny seeing slit, even though Mama said, close them. Then the screaming starts. Asa wiggles further under the sharp scented bush, curls tight as a finger poked bug, squeezes her eyes, good girl shut, and tries not to hear. Still as stone while the goats bleat and run, up the mountain in the night, away from fire, away from screams, flames lighting the sky, higher than home, screams tearing the night, screams in Asa's head. Asa's legs want to run with the goats, but Mama's sleeping spell holds them tight to the ground through the long red night, Asa cold and all, all alone. When the screaming stops, Asa's heart cries loud for Mama, though her voice stays quiet, still as stone. Mama doesn't come, but Spot Goat does. Spot Goat bleats and nuzzles at cold toes in morning dew, till Asa wriggles, snakes silent, drinks from Spot Goat like a baby kid, because Spot Goat's kid is gone, like Mama. Morning, not morning, with no warm Mama bed, smoke in the sky, stinking stronger than the grey-green bush and her rug piss-wet and cold. Waiting through that long fear morning, waiting quiet and still as stone, Spot Goat waits too. But Spot Goat doesn't know what Mama said, so she bleats till the man finds them. It's the third time this year that raiders have attacked the island. When the flames of the burning homestead light the sky, distant goat herds call the alarm. Twelve men gather from the farms, but long before they get there, the silence tells them that they are too late. They trudge on, dreading what they might find. It's as bad as they could have imagined. The house and farm buildings were made of stone, but their roofs were thatched straw. The thatch flamed quickly when the raiders lit it, and the burning roofs collapsed, destroying everything underneath. The rock walls stand like chimneys, spoke pouring from the smouldering mess inside. The husband, grandparents and dog lie dead in front of the door. There's no sign of the two women or children. The men search hopelessly. All they find is a pool of blood at the gate. Let's hope that's a raiders, one man says viciously. It probably is because a bronze dagger is lying under a bush nearby. The owner wouldn't have left it unless he was too wounded to notice. It's a small sort of payment for the dead and the women and children taken into slavery. The dagger is a murdering weapon and it needs to be cleaned of blood and cleansed of evil, but the boy who picks it up can't help coveting it. Metal is expensive. His grandmother loves reminding the family that she paid six kids in a vat of olives for their one short and plain bronze knife. This one is very fine. Its blade is engraved and the hilt is carved with the head of a horned beast. It's the sign of the bull king, says the oldest man. If he's behind these raids, the island is in big trouble. I'll take the dagger to the lady, the boy decides. If he can't keep it, at least he can be first with the news. He whistles his dog and starts across the hills to town. Three men stay to sing the dead to peace before their burial. The others go out with their own dogs and whistles to round up the straying flock, which is how one man discovers Asa, cold, wet and terrifying, sheltering under a nanny goat. What's your name, little one, he asks. She doesn't answer. He calls the others. They're so relieved to find one survivor that for a moment they're almost happy. The man who finds her is a hero. Except now he has to go to the orphan child's aunt, the husband's sister, and tell her that her brother is dead and she has a new child.